one more time. Whose schools? Our schools. Whose children? Our children. Whose voices? Our voices. Thank How many so real, much. how many real live teachers from the classrooms of the public schools are with us in this crowd? I'm glad I always feel safer when I'm in a crowd with teachers. Yeah. I want every single one of you to know, before I say another word, that teachers are my heroes. They don't receive the high rewards that they deserve. They don't receive the honor they deserve. And at this ugly moment in our nation's history, when the propaganda of the privatizing forces is demonizing and humiliating teachers, you receive less honor than you ever got before. But let me say right off the bat, as strongly as I can, that we're not here to moan and cry and wring our hands. And, and we're not here to beg the Congress and the White House to make a, a couple incremental minor changes in No Child Left Behind or in the mania, the pestilence of testing like some terrible disease, like mad cow disease that spread across this land. We are here to say you cannot fix this awful law. It needs to be abolished altogether. And that's, and that's not the only policy of government that's causing havoc in our schools. The wild inequalities of funding are more savage now than they were 20 years ago when I first coined that term. Add to this, I mean, I'm not kidding. I, in California, the kids get $7,000 a year unless you live in a rich suburb where the rich folks can go out and raise a million dollars in a night at a fundraiser, right? 7,000 for the poorest children in America, 30,000 for the richest. Add to this, add to this, the rapidly increasing racial segregation of our nation's schools. Our schools today are more segregated racially and economically than at any time since 1968, the year, ironically, when Dr. Martin Luther King was taken from us. Now, I'm old enough, my friends, so I remember vividly the words of Dr. King. I was fired from the Boston public schools because I read the students in my class a poem by Langston Hughes. And the black parents were loyal to me, so when Dr. King came to speak at a mass rally in, our home in my hometown, the black leaders asked me if I would walk with him and be one of his bodyguards. Look at me. <laughs> but I remember, I remember his words. I remember his eyes. I remember the passion and the perspiration pouring down his brow. And I remember every single syllable of his prophetic dream. Dr. King, my friends, did not say, he did not say, I have a dream that someday, north and south and east and west, we will have more efficient, more efficient, test-driven and anxiety-ridden separate and unequal schools. <laughs> Dr. King's words were pure and clear. I have a dream that someday, little black children, and if you were alive today, I'm sure you would add little brown children, and little white children, will sit together at the table of brotherhood. Nobody, nobody in power here in our nation's capital ever speaks about this anymore. They all say, you know, I too have a dream but they never tell us what crazy dream they have. More money. Secretary Duncan, Arnie Duncan. 
Arne Duncan has turned his back entirely on the precious legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. It's instead, instead, he's very, very busy trying to do Plessy versus Ferguson. Mr. Duncan, listen to me. Mr. Duncan, separate and unequal, has never been successful. It didn't work in the century just past. It will not work in the century ahead. And anybody, anyone who tells us otherwise is lying to himself and to the people of America. I'm in your schools all the time. Class size is soaring in the poorest schools. I walk into classes with 35, 40, 42 children packed into a single room. I, walk, I, walked, into a, I walked into a monstrous high school in Los Angeles. 5,000 children, 5,000 students, 12 white kids in the entire school. The school was so crowded that there were classrooms for only half those students. Where did the others go to class? They went to class in trailers, ugly trailers. I walked into a 10th grade class, history class, a wonderful teacher teaching that class. She had 42 students in that room. There were chairs for only 30. The other kids stood against the wall right in front of the students. I looked at her and said, how in hell do you teach 42 students? Don't ever ask that question. She said, here, find out. And she handed me the class and left the room. Let me tell you something. I still have to listen to people in high places in our government right here in Washington, who insist to me that class size does not matter. You know what I do? You know what I do? I always ask them where their own kids go to school. Typically in Washington, they don't even go to public schools. They go to very costly private schools where class size seldom rises higher than 15. In the worst of cases, it might creep up to 20. Let me, let me tell you something. I don't know what you feel, but here's what I believe. By the way, the, you know, the senators and the president send their kids to those kinds of schools. Did you know that? Yeah. 15 children in a class. Listen to me, if very small class size and the individual attention this allows a teacher to devote to every child, if this is good, if this is good for the children of a senator or president, a corporate executive or a big time CEO, then it's good for the poorest child of the poorest mother in America. Don't let our leaders get away with this hypocrisy. No. Let me tell you, you cannot compensate for inequalities like these by putting teachers, putting good and decent teachers underneath a sword of ignorant and narrowly numerical accountability. And, and punishing those teachers if they will not drill and kill their kids for the entire year so they can artificially inflate their scores. What we, what we have today, my friends, is not... What we have today, my friends, is not, is not intelligent accountability, but primitive and crude accountability devised by people who know nothing about children who disregard every single aspect of a child's learning that cannot be reducible to a number. Are we, 
Ori originality, originality, forget it. Creativity, forget it. Critical thinking, asking questions. There's no time for children to ask questions. If they learned to ask demanding questions, they might start to question why the people we elect to office will not keep their promises. Let me tell you something. A lot of people in the a lot of people in the media grow enraged, furious at me when I say these kinds of things. They hate it most when I speak respectfully and lovingly of teachers. Have you ever looked at Have you ever looked at Fox TV? They're sociopaths, and I have to debate. I have to debate a lot of people like them. And some of them are rather vicious people, and they use their words like sharpened knives. They cut right to the blood and the bone, and I'll tell you, it hurts. And I was not brought up for battles of this kind. But I'll tell you something, my friends, I'm too old to bite my tongue. And I don't, and I don't really care what happens to me now. And no matter how they try to mute my words, and no matter what the price I may be forced to pay, I intend to keep on fighting in this struggle to my dying day. Thank you.